Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Chulombo, and I'll be in the background answering any of your technical questions today. Before we begin, I would like to give a brief overview of the webinar console. To ask a question, go to the Q&A panel at the lower right side of your screen. Type your question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, then click send. If you do not see the Q&A panel, go to the bottom of your screen, select the icon with three dots, then choose Q&A. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. To preserve confidentiality, questions will be read by our team and will not be attributed to you. We will do our best to get to all questions during the Q&A portion of the briefing, but if we are not able to get an answer for you today, we will follow up via email. If you experience any technical difficulties during our session, please use the Q&A panel to request assistance. Now I'd like to invite each of our speakers to say a quick hello. Ryan? Hi, how are you? Kurt? And Vic? Hello, from San Francisco. Thank you. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, and that would be Ryan. Thank you, and hello, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for an executive briefing on travel reemergence in North America. My name is Ryan Mann, and I'm an associate partner in McKinsey's Travel Logistics and Infrastructure Practice, and I will be your moderator today. Um, as we just mentioned, we encourage you to submit questions throughout today's session. We expect to receive several questions during the briefing, and we'll do our best to address each of them. And if you experience any technical difficulties during our session, please use the Q&A panel to request assistance. With that, let me hand it over to Vic and Kurt to get us started. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vic Krishnan. I lead McKinsey's travel practice in North America, and in that capacity, advise airlines, hotels, airports, um, online travel agents, various players in the travel ecosystem on strategy and operations topics. On behalf of McKinsey and all of our colleagues, I thank you for joining, you, joining us in today's briefing. I'm also delighted to be joined by Kurt Weinsheimer from Sojourn. Kurt, would you like to introduce yourself and what Sojourn does? Sure. Thanks, Vic, and, and thanks a lot for, uh, for having me on today. Uh, I'm the Chief Solutions Officer at Sojourn, and Sojourn's a leading marketing platform for travel companies around the world. Um, and so working with, you know, literally 10,000 clients, we're seeing hundreds of millions of searches and bookings around the world uh, every month. And so from that, we pull, you know, insights and information that uh, hopefully will be of interest today. Thank you, Kurt. So in many ways, I really wish we didn't have to have today's conversation at all. So the COVID-19 pandemic is first and foremost, as you all know, a human tragedy. It's affected millions of lives around the world and hundreds of thousands of lives in the U.S. alone. I know personally from my colleagues, our clients, and friends and family members that this outbreak has been creating significant hardships, not just to the families it impacted, but those who have in the travel sector in particular that have had uh, demand drop off quite significantly and as a consequence um, had their lives uh, disrupted and upended as well. Like you, we are working very, very hard to protect the health and safety of our people and our clients, closely following the advice of governments, of medical experts, of health agencies, um, and, and several organizations around the world. We are hosting this briefing to share with you our latest research and thinking in the spirit of helping all of us navigate this difficult and evolving situation. Leaders are understandably concerned about the impact of travel, both due to its ability to connect people and businesses, but also for the countless number of employees in the travel sector that are facing uncertain times. So it's in that spirit that we intend to have this discussion today. The topics we intend to cover today are threefold. So we're posing three questions. The first is, what are the latest recovery trends for travel um, based on some of the data that Sojourn has been, has been data mining, as well as the research that McKinsey has been conducting? When and what are travelers booking? And what is the outlook for near-term travel? Now, our emphasis is specifically on near-term because there's enough uncertainty several months out um, that it is pretty critical to ensure that you monitor data real-time and you've got some suggestions at the end 
on what travel sector clients can and should be doing to, to ensure that they're staying on top of the latest trend. Again, we encourage you to submit questions throughout this, today's session. We will leave ample time um, at the end to answer them. And we will remind you later in the discussion how to do so um, using the chat function. So over the last few months, travel has seen a very steady but extremely modest upward trend. And what this chart shows is two lines, the white line being um, revenue um, at hotels per available room and the year over year change in that number. And the blue line is, is the number of passengers being processed by the US Transportation and Security Administration, the TSA, right? And as you see, the depth of this crisis was in April and, and, and in May, and since then has somewhat come back. Hotels started to bounce back a lot faster than airlines. Um, you also notice that hotels have some peaks and valleys a lot more than the airlines did, primarily associated with holiday periods. Um, and you know, you see right around the July 4th weekend, for example, um, US RevPAR uh, peaked a little bit relative to, uh, to what it had been prior. Um, and the same was with the uh, Labor Day weekend and other, just before the school holidays, um, as the school started opening up again. Um, however, the recovery is still very stilted. So if you, um, if you look at these curves, we're still roughly 50% off from where we were last year. And therefore, um, much of this recovery, while it certainly is welcome, has been insufficient uh, to help airlines, hotels, and other players in the travel ecosystem recover um, their, their revenues and, and get back to a path to profitability. What we've also noticed is that in the near term, as case counts have increased, interest in travel unfortunately has eroded. So the, the blue charts in every one of these, uh, these, these, chart, these graphs here is the cumulative case count of COVID-19 cases in these destinations. And you'll see that um, as uh, COVID-19 case counts have increased, um, there has been a bit of a downward trend um, in interest in that destination. And some of these destinations, quite importantly, are also those that, um, that are actually not urban markets. So, you know, it's, it's no surprise to anybody that um, people aren't clamoring to visit high density urban destinations like New York or San Francisco. Um, and initially, at least, for seeking to spend time in the great outdoors in places like Wyoming and Idaho and Florida. But even in these types of places, destinations, there has been a bit of a, bit of a downturn um, in travel interest given uh, record high case counts. So and surveys also point to increasing erosion of traveler confidence. So just as we saw travel um, interest in travel increase uh, through the summer, um, in the last few, three weeks, um, survey analysis suggests that travel confidence has unfortunately continued to erode, um, and it's eroded by about five points. On this page, we wanted to do a bit of a double click on Hawaii. So for those of you who have been following the state of Hawaii's travel reopening with great interest, um, the state opened up to domestic travelers from the U.S. mainland as of October 15th, um, uh, and a negative COVID-19 test through a series of authorized tra uh, testing providers uh, would allow visitors to, to avoid a 14-day quarantine um, once they got to Hawaii. Um, Hawaii, as many of you know, um, is very heavily dependent on tourism. And so we wanted to do a bit of a, uh, a deep dive to understand how Hawaii has been um, not just impacted by this crisis, but what has been happening since reopening. And what you'd see is that following months of uncertainty about when Hawaii was going to open, um, October 15th was actually when the state opened up again. Um, about 10,000 visitors um, came to Hawaii on the very first reopening day, uh, greatly surpassing expectations. Um, the split was about two thirds, one third between visitors and, and residents of the state who were returning home. And well, over, close to 85% of those who visited cleared quarantine. In other words, they had a test that was negative, um, and therefore they were free to, to go about um, uh, their, their, their activities in Hawaii without restriction. Um, I'm uh, happy to admit that I was one of those people who went to Hawaii very early on. Um, I visited Hawaii with my family um, in, in, in the second week, in the third week of October, um, and I found the process to be, um, to work quite well. 
um, greatly enjoyed the experience. And, and I have to confess that it was actually quite pleasurable to be in the state of Hawaii at a time when um, there were just a much fewer visitors than you typically see um, in, in the island of Oahu. The, um, the image of jump-in bookings that we saw um, in Hawaii uh, actually even preceded the reopening. So the blue line on this page shows that in 2020, um, the number of flight bookings actually started to increase even before the state opened. So even leading up to the official announcement, there was a surge in interest in Hawaii off the, the pre-crisis lows. Um, what we're keenly monitoring right now is whether this momentum will continue, um, given that there's still a patchwork of regulation. So if any of you have attempted to book travel to Hawaii uh, in the last few weeks, um, you would have learned that the, um, the state's um, focus has been on, um, on the safety of their citizens, as it rightfully should be. Um, they've been monitoring case counts quite aggressively. Um, and uh, every island or every county in the state of Hawaii um, has actually had a, much, a, a lot of leeway to be able to make decisions that are optimal for them, uh, considering the fact that uh, the, the capacity in hospitals, capacity of, of, uh, of uh, nursing and hospital facilities on the different islands quite, varies quite dramatically uh, from one island to another. We also believe that to truly understand demand, um, it's pretty important to look at micro markets. And so we have been monitoring demand with Sojourn at a state level. This data shows information from Sojourn on what has been happening in terms of hotel bookings between February and October 2020 in various parts of California and, and parts of neighboring states that are adjacent to California. So in Nevada, in Oregon, and in Arizona. And you'll see that there's a significant amount of strength in areas with state parks and access to nature. So we think about Medford and Klamath Falls, which is in, uh, the, by the Oregon border, and actually partly in Oregon as well. Um, we also see a lot of interest in places like Santa Barbara um, or in um, Inyo County in Eastern California, um, which abuts the state of Nevada as well. The real action um, is therefore not at state level data, which a lot of uh, agencies seem to monitor, but really at the micro market level. And there's been some really interesting trends in that regard. Um, it won't, as we mentioned, is no surprise that there's weakness in large urban um, area demand in like LA and San Francisco, but um, the, the outdoors continue to, uh, to be strong. And whether it's um, outdoors in the form of our national parks, um, or if it's the outdoors in the form of wineries and and um, areas like Santa Barbara that uh, allow for a lot of space and, and, and the ability to kind of stay somewhat distant from other people and visitors, um, they've all seen a surge in interest. Uh, the other interesting stats is that we, the, this summer witnessed record uh, recreational vehicle sales. Um, you know, for, for, for a period of time, it was impossible to get a recreational vehicle in many parts of the United States for lower for money. Um, and renting them actually had you know, not just wait lists, but also record uh, pricing. Um, we've also seen that visitors to the national parks are up. So Yellowstone um, National Park um, had its absolute busiest September um, in the history since records have been kept. So about a 21% increase from last year in visitors. Um, and that same has held for a number of other national parks around the country, including ones that are slightly off the beaten trail. Um, had, had seen a, a significant amount of surge in interest. If you then look at what the contributors to these differences by micro market segment are, um, there is a clear preference for drive trips over air, and therefore the extent to which a market is accessible by car is quite important. So it, the, the left side chart shows how far um, a hotel booker traveled to stay in that hotel in that property by every state. And there's two areas that we'd like to call attention to, which are Montana and the U.S. Northeast. And you'll notice that in the U.S. Northeast, um, much of the demand shift was from out-of-town tourists to relatively short-distance drivers driving from places like Boston to Maine, or Boston to New Hampshire, versus people flying in. In places like Montana, um, on the other hand, um, flights actually increased. So in other words, there were some micro markets where people were willing to fly versus drive. And therefore, in, in Western um, Montana, 
as well as in, in uh, eastern North Dakota, um, there were actually surges. Uh, the, the hotels were being occupied at that point in time by people who were traveling a much longer distance and in many instances were even flying um, to spend time in those destinations. Among Americans polled in Skipped Research's July Travel Tracker, 67% said their first trip since the beginning of the pandemic would be by car. And that figure has been pretty consistent since April. And if we reflect across the Pacific to China, where domestic air travel has now returned and in many instances surpassed 2019 levels. So China, for all intents and purposes, the domestic air travel market is back again. Um, even there, uh, initial trips were still being planned on a self-guided or self-drive basis um, and comprised activities with families rather than large tour groups. So that has also changed and, and evolved over time. So in 2020, in summary, the average distance traveled from home to hotel is about 30% lower than it was in 2019, which suggests that people are staying closer to home. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kurt to take us through our research on the next two questions. Great, thanks, Vic. Um, as, as Vic noted, there are a lot of micro trends on a market by market basis um, when you look at, at recovery. What's interesting is on the consumer side of things from a booking standpoint, there are a lot more kind of macro trends that are driving activities. Um, so this is what we'll take, take a look at. So the first thing that we looked at was lead times um, for bookings. Lead times have decreased dramatically, um, which is not surprising. But as you would imagine, given travel uncertainty, given um, questions of health, um, also, given the fact that fewer people are flying versus driving, um, that need for advanced lead time booking um, is not as great. So you can see, you know, biggest impact is on economy hotels, a decrease of 53% um, in advanced uh, purchases is, is pretty dramatic. Um, the other thing that's just interesting to note here is we talk about economy versus upscale versus luxury. Economy hotels have actually been the most resilient through the pandemic. And again, this echoes some of what Vic was talking about. Um, economy hotels tend to be in less dense markets. Um, so they are not concentrated in the urban markets, uh, places that, that people have actually fled from, from a vacation standpoint. They also tend to be much more um, road trip friendly. And finally, you know, they tend to be smaller. Um, and so smaller properties tend to have less elevators, less density, and therefore uh, feel a little bit safer in this uh, in this time of COVID. So um, in addition to the shorter booking windows, we also saw that, that um, consumers are searching way fewer uh, properties on an annual basis. So what we look at here in this chart is 2020 in blue, 2019 in gray. And this is the number of properties that uh, a customer is potentially looking at um, before making a booking. So as you can see, very high concentration in 2020 of fewer bookings. So literally the average went from looking at 19 properties to 11 properties um, in, in looking for a booking. So there are probably a couple things that are driving this. Um, one is familiarity. Uh, in talking to hoteliers, they're seeing a much higher repeat rate um, of customers. So if you think of travelers are going to places where they're going to feel more comfortable, so they're tending to go back to places they've been before. And that means they may be searching fewer properties because they're going back to those that they already know. The next thing is choice. Um, so as you're going to less dense markets, there are fewer properties to be searching for. for. So if you're thinking about um, searching in, in New York, where there are literally hundreds of properties to choose from versus a market like Bozeman um, or other places in Montana, much uh, uh, lower density of properties, less searches to go for. And then the last thing is, hitting on the previous um, slide, is given that shorter booking window just gives you um, you know, less time to be looking around. And travel it tends to be one of the highest friction um, uh, search and shopping experiences, which sometimes people hitting hundreds of searches before making a booking. Shorter booking window, shorter time potential of um, 
of less less different properties to be visiting. So what this means is hotels really need to be on top of their game as far as promoting all the different aspects of safety, what they can do and where they can go, because it's critically important that you make that strong first impression when you've got a shorter booking window and people are looking for fewer properties. So this is also an interesting thing when we think about kind of how people are shopping and booking. Traditionally, travel has been a laggard um, in the move to, to digital. Um, so tend to be, still be a high percentage of, um, of desktop searches and bookings. Um, but aligned with a lot of the studies actually that McKinsey was doing and, and calling COVID kind of the great accelerator, um, we've seen that increase in mobile shopping and booking across the board. So first, if we looked, look at um, direct airline sites and hotel sites, we've seen an increase in both searches and bookings at you know, anywhere from 12 to 15%. It's even more dramatic on the OTA and Meta side where we're seeing increases in searches of about 20% and bookings of about 24%. Now, this also lines up with the emphasis that the OTAs and Meta search sites have been placing on driving to app activity. So not surprising that they're, that they're getting um, greater traction here. But what this does is this also means that um, the travel companies are gonna have to increase that emphasis on the mobile experience. So whether that's for small properties, making sure that you've got a mobile web strong experience or larger chains uh, and, and large suppliers really driving that, that behavior. So speaking of, of messages and, and getting the word out, you know, one of the things that we've really looked at at Sojourn is what have the trends been as far as how travel companies are speaking to those consumers and, and what really does that say about what consumers care about? So early on in the pandemic, everything was about safety and cleanliness. Um, if you looked at top search engine marketing terms early in the pandemic days, um, the top terms are things like hotel open near me, okay? Hotel open was not in the top thousand searches um, typically or safe hotel in San Francisco. So safety and cleanliness was a huge story early on um, and hotels were very focused on yeah, certifications, um, uh, getting kind of accreditation and credit for the work they've been doing. But very quickly, consumers kind of moved off and said, look, safety is table stakes. I, mean, I, need, I need to get out and I need to know that I can get out to something, you know, exciting. And so quickly, properties had to move and experiences had to move beyond cleaning. Um, and there were two key drivers that they needed to talk about. One was um, real-time activities. So what was open around me? What can I actually do? And the second thing was flexible booking. Um, flexibility became um, a top criteria for, for searches and, and, and bookings. And we saw this in a, in a recent study that Focusrite did is one of the top drivers for um, actually booking was increased flexibility uh, around that. And then last, lastly is that drive to local um, that we had been talking about earlier is emphasizing staycations. So much more of the messaging and targeting started being driven not to broad markets where you potentially have a lot of fly-in, but a lot more localization. We saw this very much so in the West and especially um, in the Northeast, as you saw it in those charts that we looked at earlier. And so the shift in messaging became really important. Um, and, and also this messaging represents a, a real challenge when you think about managing things from a revenue management standpoint. So you've got short booking windows, uh, you've got high desire for, um, for high flexibility on cancellation rates um, and, and much more local travel, travel. So less predictability and higher leisure versus business. So creates a lot of, of challenges, honestly, um, in, in running hotels and protecting business from a go forward basis. But um, 
let's jump to the next slide. You can see kind of we pulled out an example of, of one hotel to, to see kind of how that trend moved and worked for them. So in March, in the kind of pre-pandemic days, typical uh, advertising you would see, you know, hitting kind of the, the aspects and elements of the of the hotel property. Um, and then very quickly, though, uh, understanding this this hotel is in a market that tends to have a high fly fly in market. Quick shift um, into a much more dry market localized story. And they saw literally a 3x improvement in conversions by both changing the messaging and changing targeting so that they were focused much more on regional travel versus national. But now as we're moving kind of uh, forward and consumers are getting more comfortable, um, now actually we're seeing budgets are tightening. You know, as, as we've talked about kind of this K recovery, um, for a lot of travelers, especially um, younger travelers, those budgets are getting tighter. So much more now we're seeing that um, hotels, uh, attractions, are starting to push out on specials to drive that um, that demand and, and start filling hotels, especially in a time when business travel, group travel, those things that tend to fill up the business are really not there. So last thing that we're going to look at is near-term travel. Uh, and so what we did is we took a look uh, at expected travel for Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, it's going to be a really interesting thing to look at. And the idea that we're still talking about what travel for Thanksgiving might look like in you know, almost mid-November just tells you how incredibly dynamic the market is right now. So no big surprise um, that air bookings and hotel bookings are down um, pretty dramatically from 2019 to 2020, right? 57% drop for air, 42% drop for hotel. Um, you know, the difference in drops is one, as we know, there's been a lot more constrained inventory um, on the air side than on the hotel side. Uh, we also know the increase in road trips. There's also potentially what we're looking for is, given the, um, the safety concerns, we're checking to see, will more customers end up staying in hotels than staying with family this year? So that'll be an interesting trend for us to look for. Um, but so, you know, initial numbers, you know, really are pretty, 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 uh, pretty challenging. However, here are a couple of things to think about. One is, let's talk about um, the last-minute booking trend. So, as you can see, there's a dramatic increase in bookings from, you know, right now, 16 to 60 days. We saw an 18-point increase in trips booked within the last 60 days. And I think we're going to see that accelerate just as we have um, across the board. And so, when there's less reliance on flight, more reliance on drive, there's a better chance um, that that we're going to see a possible possible uptick. We're also starting to see um, airlines like United, JetBlue, and others um, are starting to increase their uh, their availability in their flights um, coming into Thanksgiving. So while we're seeing you know downward trend driven by COVID, we're seeing spikes as anybody talks about the possibility of a vaccine. And both airlines and hotels are really betting on um, on a bit of a, a last minute uh, last minute surge. The other thing that um, that hotels and airlines are thinking about is longer stays. So with more remote school, um, with different vacation plans than the past, given how COVID is set up, um, we're seeing longer trips. Uh, from 2019 to 2020. So this looks at the number of trips that are more than four days long. Um, and so having, seeing that increase also is an area where uh, hotels are looking at incentives for longer stays. So here we're seeing not so much straight discount, but potentially fourth day free, fifth day free, because right now the longer customers in your hotel, given the limitations of of activities outside the market, the more potential you have to, um, to potentially 
make money off that property, I mean, off that customer during their stay. So this is going to be an interesting thing to look at as we um, as we understand remote work, uh, workations, et cetera, um, to see how many people actually extend those Thanksgiving trips. And then, you know, this this is probably, I think, one of the more interesting things that really reflects uh, the uh, the impact and the COVID impact on destinations. Um, so here what we did is uh, we took a look at the top destinations for flight-based ser flight, flight, uh, searches and then top destinations for hotel searches. So starting on the airline side, I mean, this is a clear sign of, flight from the urban markets, right? New York going from number one, which is traditionally a top market for um, uh, for Thanksgiving, dropping all the way down to number six, Chicago diving down. Um, you know, a market like San Francisco literally falling off the top 10. Um, these are pretty dramatic moves as people are potentially also not going home for, for, for Thanksgiving, but wanting to go somewhere. And so as, as a result, you're seeing increase in vacation destinations. So think of Denver, Colorado, places that are a lot more open. Um, uh, Orlando, Miami, Vegas. So I may not be able to go home for Thanksgiving, but I definitely want to go somewhere. Um, and we're seeing the same thing reflected on the, uh, on the hotel side. If you look at, um, you know, note that Chicago and Hawaii, Hawaii being, you know, really challenged as far as flights and so forth, you know, falling off of the top 10. Um, and then when you look at market like Denver coming in strong, Miami coming in strong, um, you know, a market like Denver wasn't even in the top 10 for hotels um, last year and now is number four. So, again, we're seeing this you know, big shift from urban to non-urban. And it's interesting to see the shift from kind of, if you will, maybe home markets to, to vacation markets. So hopefully this gives you a decent un, uh, sign of kind of the real changes that we're seeing um, in, in travel based on the, uh, the COVID experience. And it'll be interesting to see how many of these trends uh, sustain themselves moving into not only the first half, but the back half of 2021 as, um, as recovery comes through with COVID. Thank you, Kurt. Um, very interesting presentation on, on uh, recent trends as well as what's been happening uh, during the Thanksgiving period. So to summarize, uh, the real question we get from a lot of travel executives is, what does this all mean for me? Um, and so the implications, in our view, are uh, manifold. So the first is uh, you've got to monitor real-time trends and not just your own booking data. It's hard to hype upticks in demand or fret excessively over downticks in the near term. There's also a great need to understand demand at the micro-market level and also by micro-segment, since different demographics are showing very different demand patterns at this time. And therefore, granular data, whether it's internal or third party, is pretty critical. Second, it's pretty critical and key to be nimble, not just in monitoring data, but reacting to frequently changing restrictions on travel. We just noticed, for example, San Francisco um, yesterday announced that they're shutting down indoor dining uh, with the recent surge in case counts in the, in the Northern Bay Area in California. Um, and therefore, being able to be agile and respond to these changes is quite critical, quite key. Kurt used the phrase great accelerator earlier, and that is very much the case in terms of the adoption of mobile. And further, messages are getting stale a lot faster. So if you're in travel advertising or in search engine optimization, staying ahead of how you, you direct your marketing spend is going to be quite important. All that being said, many things still stay the same. So Thanksgiving is likely to provide a relative bump versus travel demand earlier in the year. So it's probably going to be pretty muted relative to in previous years. But some things are also going to change as the destination mix um, is going to be pretty different. Families may choose to meet in new locations away from home. And as Kurt mentioned, um, perhaps even not stay with, with their um, with relatives, but actually stay in hotels instead. And so you can therefore expect a lot more late booking 
and unfortunately late cancellations as well, as, and the booking cycle therefore is compressed and pretty volatile. And with that, we're at the end of our formal presentation and we'll transition to the question and answer part of our discussion. Thanks, Vic. We'll now turn to questions from the participants today. As a reminder to ask the question, please go to the Q&A panel at the lower right side of your screen, type your question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and click send. If you don't see the Q&A panel, select the circle at the bottom of your screen with the three dots and select Q&A. With that, let's get started with some of the questions. First question, why would a destination like New York City have a much lower, which has a much lower positivity rate, do worse than places like Orlando and Miami that have COVID rampant at this time? Vic, do you wanna kick us off with that one? Yeah, happy to, and then Kurt, please do chime in as well. Um, I, the, the fact is that it's not just about the COVID count, it's also about two or three other factors, right? The first is uh, the perception of density. So one of the benefits of a place like Miami is that a lot of the activities that you can perform are, are outdoors and that's perceived to be safer than having to be indoors like a lot of New York City attractions are. The second is, um, is what do you do at your destination? So uh, one of the, the biggest challenges of this crisis has been, you know, is not just around people's concerns around biosecurity, but also around the types of activities that people enjoy. So if you go to New York, um, and you can't go to Broadway because the, the, there's no plays that are being performed. If most restaurants have very uh, constrained seating capacity or aren't open at all or only available for takeout, that detracts from the experience of having to visit New York City. And therefore, as a result, um, traveler preferences have very much skewed away from large, dense urban locations towards um, cities and, and, and rural areas that are seen as being able to offer a lot more outdoor attractions versus uh, versus indoor. And that has been true even when COVID case counts have gone up, though within reason, as in some of the data that we shared with you earlier shows you that with the recent upsurge in cases, even destinations like Wyoming and Idaho that historically had seen quite a lot of a surge in, in demand um, have started to see a bit of a downtick in interest uh, given the increase in case counts. Great, thanks. Moving on to our second question. Do we think that the shift from urban locations to vacation setting will continue once a vaccine starts to become available? I think this is in reference to the chart that showed the top 10 uh, destinations. Um, Kurt, do you wanna take that one? Sure, uh, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I mean, the, the real answer is we don't know, uh, but but I think what's, what's really interesting is is that talking to um, uh, to uh, hoteliers and, and travel companies that are based in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, a lot of these rural markets, um, they sure hope that this is a trend and they think it's a trend. Um, and they are going to be marketing very aggressively to those people that came and visited um, this summer. For a lot of these customers, it was the first time they had ever been to a lot of these markets. And they have pretty great experiences. And so you're going to see very aggressive remarketing, reactivation uh, of those visitors that came this summer as you trend into the winter to try to get people to, to visit um, for winter outdoor activities, and then again for next summer. Uh, I also think that, you know, when you see the resilience of, um, of the um, of the kind of, you know, Verbo, Airbnb, vacation rental markets. I think that trend of, um, of, of alternative accommodations also speaks well to and supports kind of non-urban destinations. So um, I think we will see this as a continued trend, um, uh, but I think that you're going to see, you know, a rebound once New York becomes New York again, San Francisco, San Francisco again. Um, but I think it's going to take a while. I think it's going to be a longer time before people are um, able and comfortable to be in tight places indoors, at least until the weather gets a heck of a lot better. Thanks, Kurt. 
All right, let's move on to our next question. Uh, what trends have we seen in payment preferences since March? Since March? That's an interesting one. Because I think maybe uh, you're best suited to kick that one off. Yeah, I'll kick it off. And Kurt, I mean, you, you folks at Sojourn see a lot of uh, data and, and on payments preferences as well, so I'd love your view. Um, the, the fact is that uh, even before this crisis, uh, before COVID-19 um, consumed our lives, if you will, um, we had started to see a shift in payment preferences away from uh, from high contact uh, card swipe type uh, type uh, payment mechanisms at hotels towards contactless payment mechanisms, and at least in North America, and that trend had had, had certainly um, started to take shape even before this crisis started, and and all we've seen um, is an acceleration um, since the crisis is, um, has um, has has taken has taken shape and taken hold uh, in China in particular. Um, there has been a significant move towards digital payments, and that uh, that is a trend that we expect um, will eventually uh, be the case of be so prevalent in much of Asia. Um, and so, I think that that's a the, the trend towards digital payments, if anything, has probably been accelerated by uh, by this crisis. Kurt, I don't know if you have a view on on, on payments in particular. Yes, definitely. We're seeing the same thing, and, and I think one of the reasons also is as you get to the contactless hotel experience, everything becomes more app ex, app driven. Um, there's a lot more of you know, even even when you think about restaurant experiences, we've got people that are coming in. They're saying, "Look at our menu on the phone. Make your payment uh, on your phone," uh, and so it it is hitting both kind of in a you know, pre-purchase and in, in market side of things that uh, there's a lot more alternative payment going on uh, than, we, than we've seen in the past. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, interesting question. Um, kind of reading the tea leaves and based on the, the data that we're seeing so far, what is the forecast for the spring? Um, I don't know, Kurt, if you've got some early insights into what we're starting to see on the Sojourn platform. Maybe you want to kick us off on that one. Yeah, happy to. We've been we've been um, looking at this, and we were actually we've seen kind of you know a big kick. I mean, you can literally if you go to the Sojourn website, we've got a COVID dashboard, and you can see as soon as the announcement of the vaccine came on, there was a shot in surges and bookings for both. Um, uh, flights and hotels. And so we, we dug in to see what does Q1 actually look like. Um, and the reality is there's a bit of an increase, but we're seeing that things are still, the booking windows and search windows are so short right now um, that it's still looking pretty, um, pretty tight in Q1. And we're not seeing a massive surge in, uh, in increases. And I think that it's going to be, you know, very much obviously vaccine driven, but also weather driven. Um, I think that as we move into later in the spring, we're going to see a better uptick, whether there's broad vaccine activity or not. To Vic's point, people want, need to be, you know, given space. So, so the more they can be outdoors, the more that they're going to travel in the short term. Agreed. And, and, and to build on what Kurt said, um, if we look at what's been happening in China, which has throughout this crisis been a bit of a leading indicator um, for uh, travel propensity um, around the rest of the world, uh, we're starting to see that uh, travelers, in, while they skewed early on towards um, less dense, more outdoor type destinations, um, that preference has now been pivoting back towards more urban locations as more you know, restaurants are open, museums and other activities are open um, in urban locations as well. And so if we look to the spring, um, and if consumer confidence actually does increase, and I think the vaccine was a shot of adrenaline, or at least news about the vaccine was a shot of adrenaline um, in many ways, um, if that persists, and that's a big if, um, the, we, we can expect uh, a, a spring um, that, uh, that, that maybe has a more uh, sort of quote-unquote pre-crisis normal destination mix. Um, than, 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 than before. But all of that is, a, is, a, is contingent on um, case counts, it's contingent on um, what local governments and, and regulators do in terms of imposing travel restrictions, and, and, um, and not just on air travel um, and on testing but all needs, but also restaurants, hotels, um, 
and other forms of indoor recreation. That's a, that in many ways is, is almost the biggest driver of what you will see um, in, uh, in, in the stats. What's yeah. right? Great, thank you. All right, next question. And, and this is uh, certainly relevant given the kind of breaking news that just came out that uh, the US has topped 100,000 cases for the ninth day in a row. Um, when we think about who's traveling now, do we have any additional information regarding the age group, the age groups of the travelers? In the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a hypothesis that only the younger travelers are the ones who have the willingness to uh, go out and travel. Vic, would you like to kick us off on that one? Yeah, I'll kick us off. Maybe we can start with China data as well. And then Kurt, I know you've got um, information on, on topics like this from, from your research as well. Uh, which is that in China, there absolutely was a skew towards uh, younger and more urban travelers essentially fleeing those those urban environments. Um, now, there's a number of factors that drive this. It's not just propensity to travel, but also the fact that it's a lot easier to plan travel if you're an individual or if you're in a or a couple uh, than it is to do so with uh, families and children and having to to work out uh, schools and other such um, such issues. Right. So some of the change is less a propensity and preference change as much as it is just a function of the fact that um, the circumstances of younger travelers can often um, make them more footloose than not, uh, in addition to them being um, uh, you know, less directly impacted in many ways uh, by the pandemic. That being said, though, um, our earlier caution around micro segments and micro markets still holds. So in the U.S., as an example, we've seen that amongst the relatively higher income, older demographic, um, there actually hasn't been as much of a downtick as you might expect in travel propensity. So um, there are a lot of uh, people who um, in retirement have taken the view that they want to enjoy their golden years and as a result, um, and are not gonna essentially be uh, quote unquote intimidated by the virus and therefore still want to travel. Now the destinations that they're traveling to are different, they're not flying to New York to watch a play as much as they are you know, flying or driving to Montana in an RV to enjoy the outdoors. But if you, if you actually do look at some of the data from the national parks, the demographic uh, from an age perspective has not shifted as much as you might think. Yeah, that's right. We, we've, we've seen a lot of similar stats, especially one of the things that is driving this is, is that we saw early on um, there is a, a lot more willingness for risk uh, in the younger demographics and uh, in that those, those groups tended to jump on the promotions. And so as we were looking at propensity to hop on a flight given, given the, the option, we were seeing a, lo a younger demographic um, jumping on that opportunity. Um, however, we are seeing an increase in, in, if you will, kind of you know, older age groups starting to travel. And one of the things that's going to be really interesting to watch is we're also seeing, again, that split in the economics. Uh, uh, in, in looking at a, a focus rate study around kind of, you know, what travel budgets are going to look like, your younger demographics are much more dramatically hit um, by, by a travel budget constricting than your older demographics. So that's going to come into play as we think about where and when and how people travel is, um, is how the recovery or lack of recovery for certain demographics impacts their ability to do long haul flights, regardless of safety um, versus more localized travel. Great, thank you, Kurt and Vic. Our sixth question, um, given that there's such a large emphasis on staycations and nearby travel, how can airlines navigate that and how should they approach marketing? Maybe the, the question, how, what are we starting to see? How are they approaching marketing? Yeah, so I think there's, there's been um, a, a couple of shifts, Ryan, in terms of how um, the airlines have approached marketing, right? The, and, and maybe we'll reflect on what's happening around the world and not just in the U.S. Um, so what's been fascinating is the all-you-can-fly deals in Asia have been hugely successful. What that means is for a fixed fee, you're allowed to take an infinite number of trips, um, which is you know, somewhat feasible during a time of relatively lower load factors without a huge concern about displacement costs. Um, 
what what um, I was on a on a on a in a conference with a with the chief commercial officer of a large U.S. airline um, a few weeks ago, and and he was tell, mentioning that uh, in their data they're finding that um, much of the reluctance has actually been in people taking their first flight, but once they fly and they find that the experience is actually pretty manageable for the people are are wearing masks on in some instances at least. Um, until December, many of the U.S. airlines have been enforcing empty middle seats. Um, that is, they, they found that the flight experience actually is not "quote unquote" scary, and therefore um, their propensity to book repeat trips has been much higher. And so, some of these all-you-can-fly deals are really driven um, with the with the intent of saying, you know, come start flying again. Once you experience it, you realize that um, it's it's not it's not that bad, and and you're therefore willing to fly on a repeated basis after that, right? And so. Travel marketing might have to shift towards relatively new forms of, of revenue um, and, and new forms of innovation um, to bring demand back again. We're also starting to see um, a shift towards, in, at least for international travel and near haul international travel, a renewed emphasis on testing. So a number of U.S. airlines and airports um, in conjunction with the governments of Caribbean islands um, and Hawaii, we mentioned Hawaii during this, talk, this presentation, um, have have used testing as a vehicle and a mechanism to start seeing uh, get get demand and consumer confidence back again. Um, now the scalability of testing um, is still uh, remains to be seen, given that uh, you know if the TSA is to process two and a half million passengers a day like they were before this crisis, um, that's a lot of testing, and we still don't have that type of testing capacity to be able to reassure customers. But I, I think the fact is it's not necessarily. Um, critical for that to be at a nationwide scale, but for certain destinations, um, some type of testing um, uh, element might actually be very helpful to reassuring consumers um, and help them bring back to uh, help bring them back to airlines again. Yep, I think that where where hotels are kind of moving beyond beyond safety and that that's table stakes, I think the airlines are still very much emphasizing that need for safety, testing, um, et cetera. And they're also taking very much a market-by-market -market approach. So um, they can shift their inventory, as you know, on a market-by-market -market basis. So you're seeing these, you know, jumps and drops in um, in, in seats on a market-by-market on a -market basis, especially you're seeing that in Europe with, um, with a lot of the low-cost carriers really adjusting pretty quickly um, to market demand or lack of market demand. Um, big challenge, but you know, but uh, also an opportunity for those that can be the most agile. Thank you, Kurt and Vic. And I think we've probably got time for one more, so let's pull this one. We've talked a lot about North America uh, and you know how things are going in the US. But, you know, there are regions across the world that are faring much better in terms of the virus, and we're already starting to see travel return. And so the question we would ask here, uh, or it looks like is being asked here, is what can we learn from regions that are already starting on their path to recovery, China, for example? Yeah. So uh, we can reflect on what's happened in China, and then perhaps more importantly, what uh, of those lessons are actually generalizable to the rest of the world, right? Because not everything from China um, is going to be easily replicated in other parts of the world. So for those of you who have been following China closely, um, they instituted a very aggressive track and trace mechanism relatively early in the crisis. And, um, and it's heavily, it's highly digitized, so it's all on a QR code on your phone. Um, and um, the scale of testing was ramped up uh, relatively rapidly as well. And what that meant is that consumer confidence in China, at least domestically, returned um, even before uh, we've had a vaccine. So while a vaccine in North America is seen as a, a bit of a, the, the big unlock for travel demand to return, in China, much of that has happened without a vaccine. So let's reflect on airlines, for example. Both domestic cap capacity and demand have now surpassed 2019 levels. Um, in terms of yields, while in the first five months of the crisis, which in China, you recall, started earlier than it did in the U.S., it was really in December and January that they'd already started to see a downtick. Um, after five months of decline, affairs have started to slowly recover. So in August, actually, yields were starting to climb back up again um, and after about a 20% drop um, from peak to drop uh, the, it, early in the crisis. 
Um, when you look at the uh, what what the airlines have been doing to respond to changes in COVID counts, case counts in certain regions, so Beijing, for example, in August or September had a, a modest surge in, in case counts. Uh, it they very quickly uh, reacted. So when there was a resurgence, airlines within 11 to 13 days they they reacted to um, to the resurgence of, of case counts, and and then in about a month or two they were able to deploy that capacity back again. So there was a significant amount of agility in terms of how they react, responded. And then that's all a domestic story though. If you look internationally, um, capacity is still heavily distressed. And much of that is driven by um, Chinese res uh, traveler restrictions by the government on international visitation. Um, and, and numbers are increasing from essentially near zero, but incredibly modest. In fact, the US has more international travelers uh, returning right now. Um, given the fact that, that air travel with places like Mexico, for example, is still open than China does. And if you look at the hotel side, both ADRs and RevFAR hit to essentially 2019 levels during the National Day holiday, which was a few weeks ago, and which implied you know, pretty strong leisure demand. If you then look at which of these lessons um, can be applied to North America or Europe and other parts of the world, uh, the one aspect that I think is, is resoundingly true is that travelers want to travel. So there is a, it's a primal human instinct. You know, all the, the concerns around are people going to not want to travel again are unfounded. Uh, we believe that that uh, is, is true, whether it's in China or whether it's in the US or Canada or North America or, or Europe. Um, we also know that uh, leisure travel comes back first. It takes a, slow, a longer time for business to return. Um, and we also know that, um, you know, travel at least early on skews younger um, and it skews uh, towards local drive destinations rather than um, than further destination. What is not quite generalizable from China to other parts of the world is the pace at which corporate travel recovers, as an example. And if you look at corporate travel in particular, in China, um, the state and state-induced mandates are a fairly big driver of corporate travel um, intensity and, and corporate travel demand. Um, that is not the case in, in Europe. It's not the case in, in North America. And therefore, uh, the corporate travel recovery path might be much slower when it comes to uh, the comparison between China versus, um, let's say, the United States. Similarly, um, the level of consumer confidence being driven by um, relatively um, direct and interventions by the government in terms of track and trace mechanisms, um, that happened in China. Um, it's hard to see that happening in the US uh, in particular. And therefore, we will continue to see government restrictions rather than, than government um, track and trace mechanisms being a significant driver of demand in North America. Great. Well, I think that covers our time today. Um, so thank you to Kurt and Vic for leading us today. On, on behalf of the McKinsey Travel Logistics and Infrastructure Practice and our friends at Sojourn, we want to thank you all for joining us today. We hope you found the content informative and would appreciate it if you could share your feedback via our one minute survey, which will appear once you close uh, the event console. Thank you again. Please stay well and have a wonderful rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Thank you all.